One of the core ideas I aim to promote on the Bioneer is that we can and should train every aspect of our performance and health. Losing weight, improving cardio or lifting heavy weights in constrained movement patterns should not constitute a comprehensive fitness program. But for me, the biggest omission is brain training. Why work so hard to improve your body and not pay any attention to brain function? In the digital economy, skills like the ability to focus, to manipulate data and even to make the right impression on someone all play a huge role in determining success. And as we'll see here, it's also a very important differentiating factor when it comes to athletic performance as well. The main issue? Brain training, also called cognitive training, is a somewhat controversial topic. We now know that due to brain plasticity, the brain's ability to grow and change shape in response to environmental pressures, it is at least somewhat possible to train the brain. It's no surprise then to learn that countless apps, services and programs have sprung up to try and capitalise on this opportunity. Usually such packages extrapolate wildly from the scientific evidence and charge a lot of cash for results that they can't guarantee to deliver. Less insidious are helpful suggestions such as using dual NBAC to improve working memory or exercising to enhance general cognitive performance. There are plenty of studies supporting the notion that dual NBAC training, for example, can work wonders for your working memory and that physical fitness directly benefits memory, mood and focus. But even then there are questions. To what extent can you expect your memory to noticeably improve if you start running? How much running do you need to do? Is there an upper limit as to how much benefit you can get? More troubling, do exercises like dual NBAC improve working memory across the board? Do they have near transfer, to use the technical lingo, for similar tasks? Or do they only improve working memory for that task and others like it? How can you tell if a task truly has improved useful brain function beyond the kind that can be tested in a controlled setting? For example, the dual NBAC test is a challenge that involves holding onto data and manipulating it, using working memory. The goal is to look out for repeats in the series of numbers, but where the conditions become increasingly complex. One study, published in the Journal of Cognitive Enhancement, found that this could indeed effectively improve working memory. To determine this effect, the study used a number of strategies. These included a test of general fluid intelligence, an IQ test, to which there was no measured benefit, an object NBAC test, the same thing but using real world objects, for which there was a clear benefit, and a task switching test, for which there was a less pronounced benefit. The study also used an EEG to measure brain activity. So if we break this down, we see that dual NBAC was unable to increase IQ scores, which are rife with their own issues to begin with, and the object NBAC test is really just the same test using slightly different stimuli. Task switching is a more interesting result, showing that this could improve serial tasking in the workplace, thereby allowing a person to switch from one activity to another more effectively, with a less of a cost to productivity. But even then, this is measured using a very artificial test that really doesn't represent anything we do in real life. And keep in mind that in order for this type of training to be useful, it must also be more beneficial than real world activities like chess or practicing math. Otherwise, why not simply perform those much more interesting activities instead? What I find really interesting about this is that there are some very clear parallels to functional training. We can improve our working memory, but if the setting is highly artificial, we might find it doesn't hold up in a real world setting. This is especially true seeing as working memory is, in all likelihood, multimodal. We tend to talk about working memory in terms of 7 plus or minus 2, that is to say, a person can hold on to 5 to 9 digits whilst trying to find a pen to write down a phone number. But working memory is also responsible for a football player's ability to remember the relative positions of all their teammates on the field while they run in the other direction. Can we really describe this as 7 plus or minus 2? We do not experience the world in discrete packages of accurate data. Rather, we clutch onto disparate bits of information and then use these to form an impressionistic idea of the world around us, a patchworld creation that is useful enough rather than perfectly accurate. And so it should come as no surprise that working memory works best in this manner. This makes a lot of sense in the context of neuroscientist Daniel Wolpert's belief that the brain evolved for movement or, as I like to think of it, to communicate with the environment. This is also, of course, why we have bodies. As Walpert described in his excellent TED talk, we really are Bayesian inference machines. We make predictions based on large amounts of imperfect data coming in from our senses. And this also provides another explanation as to why we see activation in the cerebellum, a brain region primarily responsible for handling proprioception and body sense, when engaging in abstract cognitive tasks. So how might we practically train working memory then? Often the best place to look when it comes to cutting edge training is the world of athletics. This is where a lot of money is spent trying to optimise human performance. 
and cognitive training makes a lot of sense for athletes. After all, the outcome of a game or match is seldom predicated on the objective strength, speed or endurance of the athletes in question. Here, there is an absolutely tiny amount of difference between any two candidates. Instead, what's more important is the way the players perform on the day, which comes down to the decisions they make, their ability to stay focused, under pressure and much more. So for an example, how might an athlete train their working memory in order to make better decisions in the heat of a contest? One study found that using the Simon task, an activity that requires participants to make different physical responses to different stimuli, could help improve a lacrosse player's ability to target the right part of a goal quickly. Another study looked at the use of 3D multiple object tracking tasks to successfully improve the decision making of football players. This is one of the first studies to show a useful transfer effect between a non-contextual cognitive training and an actual sporting event. But again, notice it's still in 3D space, it's still much more sensory rich than a dual MBAC test. Other studies have also shown that athletes have a generally higher proficiency when it comes to performance in these tasks. So while using 3D object tasks might be of some use to athletes, it's also true that sports themselves are a fantastic form of brain training that the rest of us could benefit from. Likewise, playing computer games might have some benefit for real world decision making. One study found that 3D action games could improve decision making speed with no loss in accuracy. This should come as no surprise as computer games require heated decisions based on large amounts of information all immersed in a 3D space. That said, it's worth noting that this study was funded by the Entertainment Software Association, demonstrating another issue with research in cognitive training, that there's often a lot of vested interests involved. I personally believe that there's a huge amount of potential benefit for playing computer games at a high level, especially when they make the jump to virtual reality for a truly multi-sensory context. I also believe that brain training games should learn a thing or two from 3D titles like Devil May Cry or Overwatch. And the military clearly agrees, as they've been using esports to recruit drone pilots and fill other roles for some time now. Whatever the case, many sports coaches are now selling cognitive training as part of their programs. These protocols often involve running between numbered cones or carrying out complex sequences of events and responding to commands. Seeing as this type of training immerses the athlete in physical movement while asking them to perform mental tasks, there's a fairly high chance that it could be beneficial. But of course, most football players are not Albert Einstein. Why don't we see more Nobel Prize winning athletes? The answer may be related to the more modular descriptions of the brain. That is to say that this is a different type of intelligence and one that has little relation to the kind of quick decision making and reflexes required by most sports. That's not to say I subscribe to a theory of multiple intelligence where each works entirely independently of the other, but there's no denying that you can train for specific skills and abilities. Just as someone who goes on lots of long runs is training their body, but not their strength specifically, so we can learn to predict the movements of players on a pitch, benefiting the brain, without that transferring over to abstract reasoning and creative problem solving. But we can take the lessons we've learned from looking at this type of training and apply it to other areas. Areas like memory, creativity, focus, problem solving, emotional intelligence, self-monitoring, emotional hardness, and so forth. So here we want to make the training again as multi-sensory as possible and as close to the specific skills and abilities we want to benefit. We can see an example of this used by Navy SEALs, the hooded box drill. This is a particularly intense mental exercise that involves placing participants in a hood that blocks their sight and hearing, then pulling the hood off in an unexpected combat situation. This is intended to not only desensitize them to fear and shock, but also to train rapid decision making and orientation. This is a step above most things we consider brain training, but it's not impossible to replicate with, say, virtual reality. The more multi-sensory and grounded the activity, the greater the likelihood of seeing real transfer to other skills and situations. For most of us, this usually means taking up new hobbies and activities that already exist. Playing musical instruments, programming, meditation, chess, rapping, reading aloud, these all have immense benefits, exercise, Keep in mind that the activities you engage in every single day, such as your career, are likely to have the biggest impact on your brain function and may even alter aspects of your personality. My recommendation would be to take up a few of these highly cognitively demanding activities, picking the ones that best align with your own goals, strengths and weaknesses. And of course there are countless other aspects of brain training that work in entirely different ways, that don't strengthen particular areas or networks of the brain. For example, the very process of learning new skills will increase plasticity, thus helping you to learn every other new skill. Then there's nutrition. Or how about the simple fact that you can drive more energy to your brain using cardio and other methods to improve metabolic rate and cardiovascular health. There are endless ways to improve brain function, and I have a hunch this is going to be a massive topic in the coming decades. The best thing we can do right now is to get a head start. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please leave a like and share it around. That helps me out immensely. 
I'd love to know what you think about cognitive training and what methods you've used for yourself to enhance your grey matter. If you like the idea of training that goes beyond the usual small selection of exercises to build every aspect of human performance, then you may enjoy my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training. That program actually combines both physical and cognitive training in a single routine that anyone can follow and provides a lot more information to sink your teeth into. There's a link to that in the description down below, and there's a discount on right now whilst many of us are in lockdown. Either way, thank you so much for watching this one. Subscribe if you want to see more like it, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks a ton, and bye for now.